let's conduct today's session. We have Parul Sharma, who is a senior design engineer in analog uh, domain and has been with us for over uh, almost two decades now. So welcome Parul, and I think you can start your presentation now. Yeah, thank you, Akhil. So let me just turn on my camera. So am I audible? Yes. OK. So hello everyone. My name is Parul Kumar Sharma and I am an analog design engineer at NXP Semiconductors Noida. OK, so I am with this NXP since 2007 and I have been working in various uh, analog design domain like uh, FIES and SARDIS in the analog and also some with the related to data converters. So today I intend to present the analog design flow, uh, analog importance of analog design for the SOCs and let me just share my screen a bit. So Akhil, do you see my screen of full? It's yes, no, yes it's, it's visible, sir. Just turn on. Yeah. Sure. Perfect, so, it's coming. So this is the title of the presentation, Analog De uh, Design Deep Dive in SOCs. So today I intend to walk you through what the SOC is, where it is made and uh, how analog fits in the entire framework. And then we will go into a bit about analog design itself. OK. So the agenda would be importance of analog design, analog and digital subdivision in the modern SOC, some of the characteristics of both analog and digital systems and differences, body of knowledge required to be analog designer, particularly more important for students and aspiring analog designers. Then we will walk through typical analog blocks used in modern SOCs, future trends in analog and digital design, some trends in analog design, examples of an NXP analog and mixed signal circuits. Okay. After this, we will take some QA. So here we begin. So overall, if we look at the real world is analog in nature. So whatever we uh, have sound, pictures, motions, touch, sense, radars, all these equipments, they get the signal which is actually continuous time and uh, having small, small values. So all these things are analog in nature. So to connect to physical world, you need to have analog interface and uh, we process it through digital means, which is more efficient as it came out. So digital signals will actually require analog module always. So going to this, going into this line further, so any typical system, which is an SOC, it will have a power supply, it will have a digital signal processing here. Then there would be analog signal processing and maybe input sensor. On the output side, we have got actuator, which, which could be like transmitter, speaker or, or display. On the input, it could be like some microphone, receivers. It could be your touch screen, motion sensor, temperature sensor, optical sensor, whatever. OK, so you get the input from the real world. You, you do some kind of analog preconditioning. Digitize it, give it to digital system. So digital system is where the entire software and everything is resident. And then you want to take some actions based on that. It goes here, maybe on your display or just to on your brake pedals in wherever. OK, and in order to make it working apart from power supply, you need clocks. So cl digital signals are time, so they need a clock and we need a sense of time when our machines are operating also. Overall, when a system is integrated into a solution, this one which we discussed in last slide, so it takes a form of a SOC which NXP makes. Apart from this, NXP also make a reference design or system or board. So here you will see like NXP SOC along with other components like push buttons, some connectors to interfacing with the external. This is the USB connector, this is the Ethernet connector, and some power management chips and all that stuff. Crystal is here for clock generation. This could be your coin cell battery. So these are the modules that get made and ultimately they make the real world work. So if we look at SOC development ecosystem, so it's like this. So at the bottom, I would say are the equipment manufacturers who just make wafer processing equipment, implantation, diffusion chambers, PCB manufacturing equipments, and they do need a lot of electronics, most important part. So to make electronic uh, chips, you need electronic equipment in the first place. Then after this comes the step of process engineering where you use like physics based processes to realize the uh, to realize re usable devices. So it could be like a, a chemical uh, metal polishing or iron implantation diffusion, whatever 
so this is the uh, this is this step requires tuning your equipment to make a realizable device this is called process engineering so they have got recipes for process above this is the design engineering at device engineering level at device engineering level you conceive of like resistors capacitors transistors inductors whatever and to support this there is a technology cad space and device model space so device engineer actually wants a particular device with a particular characteristics it gets converted into processing steps how, how much time what machine is going to run for what duration and they turn around to device then device engineering people they check their device they generate their models and give it to circuit folks and circuit folks using their spy simulator they work on it so this is where we, we work analog design of circuit engineering so it has got circuit design verification of circuit layout of circuit and some level of matlab modeling for just conceptual uh, projections and all that above this hierarchy comes your digital design which predominantly in the industry is rtl coding and uh, lots of verification methodologies system c modeling and matlab modeling okay so when this entire thing is come up and soc is made then hardware solution is made where we have got pcb boards peripheral we do validation testing and system uh, system design of this along with the other components when this entire hardware set system is ready at this layer you get the software stack so you might be having your firmware bootloaders device drivers application software and what not above this today comes the clouds where the devices are connected to clouds in iot and all other things so that you can do analytics and whatever on the cloud level so if you look at everything is connected to everything in this system and it's a self generative system okay so so today the device has to be made just for analog design it has to work with digital design software board level solutions device level and uh, so any design activity has to happen in the tandem with all the connected functions that is very important now coming to let us say how what our soc uh, looks at a very macro level so the soc looks like primarily three components i would say there is a io component which interfaces with the external world on the pcb then there is an analog component and there is a digital component what we say digital component is a component which is generated from our uh, rtl logic and rtl and then it is converted into like standard cells analog is something where you size the transistors you put transistors yourself that is analog io is also a form of custom design but the goals of io are to connect to external chips protect the chip from the esd and all that so this is the io layer okay so soc is a today is a big functional system integrated on a single chip then digital i explained like rtl of standard cell library which has basic logic gates flip flop memory blocks these cells itself are designed by the analog design by the way but they are characterized and put for digital uses by automated methods analog design would be again full custom designed circuitry using like usually data converters pll data transmitter receiver oscillators etc so whatever is required to through transistors is analog design So let us look at some digital systems. So at a higher level, digital systems have like basic gates and flip flops connected in a particular fashion to realize a function. An input is a sequence of ones and zeros. That's what it is at basic level. So one is logic high or zero is logic low. Output is also a sequence of one and zero. It can support multiple I/O. So ones and zeros don't usually care about I/O, but to work in a real environment, we need to have a sense of the I/O which I/O we are going to use. Input output cells. advantage is that through this rtl coding you can implement hugely complex system it's very scalable you can just ma make a design of any complexity it is automation friendly use extensive use of eda tools is there in digital noise margins are good because signal is flipping from 0 to 1 which is like from 0 to full power supply then there is a design for testability verification inside and it is technology agnostic so if you have a design in a particular technology node by node which means we say let us a 7 nanometer 5 nanometer or 16 nanometer these are technology nodes so you can port the design to another technology you don't have to rework the rtl the processor rtl remains same but uh, it gets mapped into another technology so and this is the major push of the uh, semiconductor industry because area and power they scale with technology so push for moore's law that people have been trying to cram more and more transistors uh, in less and less area or maybe in the same area okay limitation is that it only implements boolean systems it does not support continuous time signals like transistors or my speech or voice or audio signals they have to digitize for uses by the digital systems to overcome this we come to the perspective of analog signal where the input is a continuous variable output is also some kind of a continuous variable or a sine wave or thing like that okay 
so generally it will support a custom io it will not be dedicated io not like a digital which can work through multiplicity of ios feedback is more of a design practice than an exception so the need for analog is that because digital design cannot re re realize all electronic functions we need to tune combination of transistors to achieve functionality that's for sure design space to so designers would need to navigate area power performance uh, trade offs so whatever you function you try to achieve you need to have like very competitive specs in today's world for example if you have a hand uh, handheld device or a wearable device where your battery life might be very critical so you need to achieve same in very very low power and very very frugal battery similarly process may behave differently than models which comes early in the process life cycle and circuit arch architecture is a research to key feature those who can propose good circuit architecture that would work for future uh, would be the winner in the market limitation of the analog is that the use across technology is minimum or limit limited with every technology you have to look at the design again see and uh, like very consciously port it and then redesign uh, in the cases where you need but more or less it needs a redesign so that that way analog is very technology dependent so i'll now go move to analog design body of knowledge where you what are the sources of knowledge for a aspiring analog designer so for analog designer particularly from academic or student world so we do expect from maybe generally industry expect that they have a basic knowledge of network and circuit theory at least at the level of network analysis books maybe von Wernerberg is one of them then you need to know circuit theory circuit simulation and uh, circuit layout time and frequency uh, domain behavior of basic circuit elements like resistor capacitor inductor etc overview of device physics semiconductor manufacturing knowledge of how different circuit classes works so we will cover those circuit classes later on like rc circuits filters band gap op amp regulator adc dc PLLs. you need some kind of knowledge about that then the way industry works it works through roadmaps so roadmaps is like uh, they would say next 10 20 30 years where the industry is going to be what the performance we would need what the market would need so itrs roadmaps are one they are like uh, publicly available on internet maybe few years back version, but they are good actually to look at what industry is doing in terms of area. Then there are processor roadmaps and all those things. Market predictions for future. So people do get like uh, these things published and sometimes they are available in the open domain. Standard specification. So standards are something that operate ensure interoperability between the electronic chips. So when you buy a laptop or a tablet or a cell phone, so the USB will work across across the gadgets because it is a standardized. So there is a standards body that would actually put those standard specification, define the implementation, a lot of the specifics of the implementation and leave a lot of things for the designer to design. But the, any vendor who is designing these systems like USB, Ethernet, SATA, whatever, Wi-Fi, they have to ensure interoperability. So to get that interoperability, the specification freezes the behavior of uh, all the components. And that is also a good source of knowledge for analog designers to know where the standards are going. Standards themselves have their own roadmaps, actually. What they are going to put in this year, next year, year after that. So they have evolving drafts also around that. Then research journals are very useful. And particularly if you look at papers, which are survey paper for a particular circuit type, maybe uh, oscillators or LDOs or regulators, I would say, or data converters. So these papers, they give you like 10 to 12 year survey of like past 10 to 12 year survey performance, where the industry is going and things like you get a good amount of idea. So those papers are good to study for self development. Now coming to this is just a tentative list of books. It can change based on your taste, but uh, around this, if you go that, so you have got some kind of baseline to start like basic knowledge of fabrication. So this is a book by VLSI fabrication principles by SK Gandhi. It gives you like basic fabrication steps of a VLSI. So any engineer who is going to work, he's going so he might be actually doing some layout or something. So he might need a knowledge about this fabrication principle. Then physics of semiconductor devices. This is a book where you can actually get idea of PN junctions, MOSFETs, threshold voltages and bipolar transistors basic level. Apart from this, now it comes to actual circuits, which are the lots of books I've mentioned here. So they cover typically circuit concepts, how the circuits are designed, how transistors behave, different components behave. So maybe you can just look at this list and uh, educate yourself around these books. So it would be really helps for digital design. Basic Morris Mano is sufficient for analog designer more or less. OK, so let me go to our portion of it. 
so analog subsystems in a soc so analog subsystems are what actually typically analog design teams design and deliver to their socs so class of circuits that we do are like oscillators so oscillators are timing devices they are like crystal oscillators rc oscillators pls so pls are like three types like integer pll fractional pll or multiphase pls we have got clock monitors which monitor the stability of the clock then frequency multipliers and other clock tfs is another category of timing circuit where you actually synthesize a frequency okay discrete frequency synthesize using multiple phases of the clock power management is where we work about the power supply aspect of a soc or entire system so so there is a ldo concept where a linear ldo low dropout uh, uh, low dropout uh, regulator and then switching regulator so switching regulator typically is made off chip or if there is a dedicated uh, switching regulator chip then power on resets are there band gap reference current reference voltage buffer these are the part of circuits which help us navigate the whether uh, power supply related scenarios in the soc there is a lot of scenarios like power sequencing and all that data conversion as i mentioned earlier like to, to work with analog world we need to real world we need data conversion so from analog to digital and digital to analog converters are there so these are the blocks that actually work with the real physical world and make the interaction happen and there are various classes of data converters and they cater to like different application and performance points then high speed transceivers so if we look at recently in last 20 30 years there is a lot of development in the connectivity space and which means basically there is a lot of requirement for storage for audio video media files and data from devices that is getting stored so storage is coming through storage interfaces like sata but to connect to storage interface you need a uh, high speed transceivers transmitter receivers so your hard disk your sd card they are faster and faster because there is another uh, high speed transceiver spec usb is there for usb pen drives and all the gadgets even the right now i am using a usb audio lvds is mostly for monitors and displays hdmi is again for in the video space mp is typically on the phones and display port is for the bigger ones like big tvs and all that hdmi and display ports similarly rf and wireless communication is a very important part of it so wifi is a part and they also heavily depend on data converters so all these wifi standards that we have got in our wifi 5 wifi 6 up, upcoming and then 5g and lt all these standards uh, they are analog subsystems basically af is analog front end where we uh, pack analog blocks together and give it uh, as a delivery to the uh, digital soc teams so what really happens you can just pack adcs dacs and some kind of power management and clocking together so make one bigger macro to give a uh, digital team that is typically referred as af in the industry okay we will just touch base upon the analog subsystems which is clock generation portion of it let's look at it okay so synchronous digital circuits basically they require clocks for operation uh, every flip flop and uh, it will need a clock any processor would need a clock because with clock they take data they process and transfer it and wait for another clock to work okay so clock is something which is generated by the analog portion so the circuits that work generate clocks are like pls etc so generally the subsystem works in different uh, frequencies like in a soc there are various subsystems some system subsystems are working at a particular frequency because the specification that are there to require a particular frequency sata may work at a particular frequency usb may work at a particular frequency ethernet may work at a particular frequency pci express would work at a particular frequency processor core would work at another frequency so another this clock generation becomes a very big and complex and log task so you have to take a single reference clock and generate all those clocks through as as minimum as possible pls okay so so basically clock requirement typically is into two parts one is like designed to generate basic or reference frequency say around 40 megahertz another would generate a higher frequency clock like gigahertz and all that different numbers so the reference the word reference means it has to be very accurate clock so in order to make accurate clock we need a uh, the solution is the crystal oscillator so crystal oscillator is something where on the chip side you have got a, a negative feedback amplifier here and there is a amplifier input and output pins and there is a feedback through the external crystal 
and this crystal is a quartz or some material which is cut in a let us say 100 and all those planes so with those planes it has a very high q and it operates at at particular frequency around that frequency it works and otherwise it doesn't works so this mechanical component gives a rlc load to the electronic component and this rlc load is very precise so this has become a de facto standard for reference clocks using crystals and some capacitors on the sides and analog designer works on this part of the puzzle inside the chip so crystals typically manufacturable crystals are in the megahertz range up to 40 megahertz range and for the low power application there are 32 kilohertz and uh, in that range and apart above this range it has not been very feasible to manufacture crystals so what people do is if you find something like 100 megahertz reference clock they might be using a lower crystal inside 25 megahertz and multiply by pln and give 100 megahertz outside that's how they implement because on the manufacturing limitations on the crystal side not on the amplifier side so the way it conceptually looks like in a typical implementation you have got a crystal between uh, two pins of the crystal and they connect between the input and output pins of an amplifier so the purpose of this amplifier is to basically it generates energy through the noise the device noise and the, this energy gets amplified but because of high q factor of the crystal only the frequency which crystal supports get amplified and that becomes a clock so i said it it starts with a noise of some kind of kick current or kick event in this system this noise gets so the frequency would actually settle in some time and then becomes a good frequency so this requires much more functions beyond what we have told and that's what we do at designers and these crystals might have other constraints coming from how to what kind of performance we are looking for this from this uh, from the external part point of view how much power we can give into the external part and what power consumption we ourselves take so there is a lot of performance related specifications beyond the scope of this uh, presentation rc oscillators are another class of oscillators so this is like mostly on chip oscillators inside the chip so they tend to be vary by plus, let us say plus minus 30 to 40% actually without trimming so it is like that you have got a rc delay circuit the textbook circuit that you see so there is a uh, th there is this gain stage and the rc stage so it has a operating frequency and this frequency is given by this formula basic formula so what really happens is the on die r and c both actually vary a lot so their variations get uh, added actually so variability gets added so you have got a huge variation of the clock but they are usually good when crystal is not up in the just just before power up you want to do some calculation or you want to run some digital logic you can use rc oscillator apart from this you can always trim it basically adjust it basically through some programming bits and so you can get a some kind of post trim accuracy of plus minus 5% so it does not need any external component but it requires company to trim and put the trim bits in a fuse box or something so they consume less power from crystal for the same frequency output they are cheaper but they they get uh, cheaper in terms of design cost but in terms of trimming cost they add steps and uh, hence not preferred because they don't actually give you very accurate clock but it give you some kind of clock which you need in in many cases if crystal goes dead or something like that so you need some other backup mechanism just in case then comes the work of so the clock generation which is pll so pll will take some reference clock and it will just uh, through some uh, phase lock principles it would just multiply them and give you high frequency clocks so i'll just go to the pll architecture so pll typically will have a pre divider which would actually tend to pre divide the input clock then there is a phase detector low pass filter and voltage control oscillator and there is a divide by n so the way it works is that whatever is the output frequency it is the uh, in the steady state it is the n times the this frequency reference frequency so whatever is the frequency we put here the feedback loop would ensure that these two frequencies are actually matched so output frequency is always matched to the input frequency and the by putting a programmable di divider and sizing the loop accordingly you can always get a f out variable f out from the system and if you put a fractional divider it becomes a fractional pll at this stage okay so this is like a, some kind of pll architecture where you can have flexibility by pre divider as well and all these are like programmable components as such and these are all the blocks are one which analog designer design and deliver to digital team as a pll block now let's go to the high speed interfaces 
this is like consumer uh, uh, demand is increasing for high bandwidth data in large quantities your ca camera resolution your video resolution they are increasing a lot and uh, also in gaming industry where you cannot generate the data from a physical world you actually have data generated generated from your gaming software the software can generate much more high quality data actually video data and it needs to be like displayed on the very big monitors and high frame rate monitors okay so this requires that all the data that that is going into some other system it actually runs through some kind of circuit and this circuit is a typically high speed io or certain serializer deserializer the implementation of that and uh, this makes the data connectivity between two chips or two systems actually very fast so there are design approaches that are suited to this approach and they are typically in the high speed interface uh, circuit category so there are various kind of circuits like lbds and this video transmission are all four are these are for the video transmission storage is like sata usb sd card similarly P, uh, pc peripheral was usb 23094 was there earlier now motherboard interconnect is pc express and these days another technology which is chiplet technology is very popular where you put multiple dies within the soc and there is a high speed io that lets talk uh talks between the two io so people will put let us say in ddr space also there is another uh, interface where you put high bandwidth memory so it's another chip which is actually talking to the main chip so all the sardis techniques are playing there so this is a very hot area because you need to be able to transfer more and more data with less and less power so typically the sardis board architecture would have some kind of let us say this is a lvds driver so you have got low voltage differential signaling so in this what really happens is that you have got a constant current and you leverage the transmission line theory and transmission line termination so if this is 100 ohm and if i let us say uh, put 5 milliamps of current so it will become just 500 millivolts of signal so that way by putting a constant current design uh, you actually uh, you actually limit the voltage swing here with a lower voltage swing so you can actually uh, your transition rate is your transition time is actually lowered so if you go from 0 to 3 3.3 volt and if you go from 0 to 500 millivolts you will definitely go to 500 millivolts much faster so that improves in, uh, improves your data rate then you whatever you do current you dump and you take it back and receiver here detects it so it leverages you have to match the termination of the system with the termination of the transmission and all those things come and uh, of course like if there is a 5 volt or something is coming so you need some protection switches and all that so this is one reference example i'll go to more uh, broader example now so let me just cover this example first so this is a typical block diagram of a sardis so sardis is something that implements what students study in their books on data communication that you need to actually transmit data so this part is covered by the protocol engine what i talked earlier like like usb sata all that they have got their protocol engine engines and every part of the system is defined there how it is going to behave and for the signaling characteristics are going to at least at the signal level they decide it's up to you what architecture you implement underneath so the way it works is there is a driver side so there is a protocol engine that we do handshake and there is an encoder for the line electrical line and then serializer so you put multiple bits and with a fast clock you serialize them then there is a fast driver which is actually respecting the terminations of the transmission line so it will send the signal into the transmission line it could be ribbon cable or it could be just a usb cable or a sata cable and it goes to receiver on receiver you try to actually compensate for the channel losses somehow to get a better signal then using a clock data recovery process you try to recover the data edges once you uh, once you recover the data then you try to deserialize and check with the protocol engine if the whatever is the protocol engine's uh, discipline in the data stream protocol engine is enforcing it will check again if it is not there it might actually say retransmit or something so for retransmission there would be another actually driver which would be doing the uh, two way communication here and some protocols are unidirectional where there is no like your hdmi you, you just transmitter and uh, from the video box and the tv will just play it doesn't say if the transmission quality is poor now just go to previous one this is how we check the receiver so what we do is we actually this is the receiver jitter tolerance what we do is just to check the receiver we add the noise in the edges of the transmitted signal uh, through our equipment and we check how the data stream is being recovered uh, being actually recovered 
so as we add if that uh, if the noise is near the signal frequency so uh, recovery is good as you move it away from the signal frequency you tend to lose the edges and it has to meet a mass to meet a bit error rate so this is how the protocol defined the compliance testing of the blocks so this was just an informative for this coming to this this is how typically analog design looks in a layout so you will have got all these devices put in a put together and connected through some wires then uh, th there could be some mosfets you see as mp or mn like this then there are some dummy devices around this there could be some bjts and diodes and other structures and some resistors around this so this is how a chip layout looks actually it looks very different from how you uh, draw in a textbook schema textbook so that this is the real work that goes and makes the chip uh, work actually electronic system so just wanted to show you this picture okay so let's now look at the data converter space what is this data conversion we have talked about it earlier so let's look at it slightly more detail here so data converters they are actually in various application spaces like your me medical sensors automotive and communication and uh, so what really happens is that as you go towards the high speed communication, so data converters also, this is the speed at which data converter works actually. So you need gigahertz. These days you work somewhere here actually, high speed data converter area for the latest service and the wireless protocols. And medical and all that where basically you are just taking inputs from body, you don't need that high frequency data converter. So uh, the Focus here is on basically more precision. You have more precise data converters, more number of bits and lower data rates and maybe lower powers. Sensors are also very tuned to applications they are meant for and they have got a very frequent, a tight frequency band where they work. So they typically don't require high frequency data converter, but they require extremely low power architectures here. Okay. So typically the system looks like this in a data converter. So you have got a DSP which would actually work with ADC and DAC data. This is a digital circuit. Then there's an ADC IP which would actually take some signal from the external world. Let us say if it is a RF antenna, then it could be let us say some RF chip which would generate analog baseband signal which will go through ADC and it will be used by the DSP. Or it could be some gyroscope or some sensor which would be actually giving your temperature sensor or something giving you data and you you take the analog signal digitize it and use it similarly on the output side it could be power amplifier or a speaker or something where you actually take the data put it into analog domain world and give it to this and to support this you need reference voltages ld the power management some kind of clock generation and esd protection that's what we have shown shown for the uh, data conversion point of uh, view of the soc so what happens here is that data converters actually they tend to be specified in terms more in terms of their frequency domain specs like signal to noise ratio snr or cyanide signal to noise and distortion sfdr spurious free dynamic range and all that so data the advantage of a data converter is that whatever is my analog signal i have got a digital data now i have got a digital data i can process it anyway in the digital logic i can use software i can change my strategy I am not actually bound to defining my strategy in analog, how to handle the situation. The moment to try to think of handling the situation in analog, you would do a limited way. You cannot change it once the transistors are gone in the silicon. But with digital, you can always through software, you can change your strategy, work out a new strategy, or maybe adopt the same solution to a new application because this data conversion is generic. As long as my frequency band of the ADC is there or DAC is there, I can find n number of applications for my this design. But if I say if I've got an analog amplifier which works only with the speaker but not with any other thing, then basically it's a limited application. So those those things are not a part of industry. Everyone wants to make something which is which is like multi-application basically. So if you look at the range of so data converters are used in instrumentation, battery management, low frequency center uh, sensors also. Battery management has become a very important part as like all our gadgets they have got their own batteries and with electronic ev vehicles and then autonomous cars which are electronic so there's a lot of battery component to it 
So uh, data converters, they are a very important part of all this um, game actually. Then in audio also, we have got sensors. All these sensors, they require some kind of data converter. Hearing aid design is a purely low power data converter project actually. Similarly, you have got wireless projects. In these wireless projects also, you need data conversion because whatever is the digital data coming, data is digital anyways. So you need a data converted to give it to RFIC and RFIC would be pure analog IP actually. Or RFIC will have a built-in data converter. It will take a digital data, but underneath you need a data converter before you put it to mixer or a power amplifier. Okay. Then we have got lot of like uh, these kind of applications where you've got e Ethernet, car radar and all that. Again, we need a data converter here and general purpose analog bus. This is right. So what is today happening is that people are going for it. 80 Gbps or 100 Gbps kind of applications. So they are in increasingly relying on data conversion to do the job for them. Similarly, for your 60 gigahertz radio and all that, uh, they are reliant on data converter to deliver the performance. So these are the some examples of high speed ADCs from NXP. So these were these are like published example references are given. So if you look at like this is 1.3 giga samples per second, 10 bit at 175 megawatt it's uh, and it's really commendable to do this in 0.35 micron technology actually so interleaving here means like you put like so many adcs in parallel and you just take one at a time another at a time and then you actually give a phase shifted clocks to that and then you take the output and then reconstruct the output that's how it is similarly this is another paper where see again uh, time interleaved architecture so with this 48.5 i send you to the nyquist okay this is 480 millivolts. So these are more like specifications for a standalone chips. But when you go inside the SOC, you typically tend to be these days below 100 millivolts. So with 480 millivolts and all that, it becomes actually very difficult to actually manage the power budget of the SOC. Similarly, like these are also again another SAR ADC. So when data converters come in lab, so the testing is typically done in the frequency domain. With the time domain signal, you can't actually see all these details. In frequency domain, you can just do the FFT and plot the spectrum and see what all frequency components are coming, which one are like explained from the theory and which one are the ones we need to investigate and then account for. This is all it happens with this. So in terms of like, uh, uh, so after all this calibration and all that, so they, they, all these components, they have been actually adjusted. So there are some digital assist techniques around data converter. So digital assistance is very important for analog design here. OK, so then you just improve the specification from here to here through digital calibration and assistance. That's what we are trying to show here. Now coming to power management. Power management, you cannot take away power management from a uh, electronic design power supply is going to be there. Someone is going to put AC adapter and put your chip into the power system. So inter IOT is a basically these are like devices which are like somewhere in the field or somewhere in the factory environment where they send the data and then send data to central server. So all these gadgets, they put a very severe constraints on power and volume. Actually, volume is the physical volume we are talking about. You need a very small uh, very small footprint and very low power. So, so you want to design something which is like working on a very small cell or a solar solar cell. You also want some kind of processor capability and a very limited battery capability. So in a frugal, frugal environment, it has to work actually before it gets drained. So if you look at the power uh, requirements, they are like around microwatts of power. So all these, this, these require very detailed and different design techniques from the conventional design methods. Okay. So basically, always like heavy, whatever is a digital design, it will be a high peak to peak power in some points and average power in other points. So this is something that a design paradox has coming that you have to uh, have a solution which will just have an instant surge of power somewhere. Okay, this is like again, uh, Another aspect of it where like your supply voltage is scaling in a different manner, like different batteries have a different kind of supply voltages. Super caps have a different supply voltages. Lithium ion is going to a different voltage range. So it is here that you put a power management system which would actually cater to the load side. Load is a device which, which is the end consumer of the power, which needs power to work actually. So the, these are the trends where analog is selected to go from 0.8 volts to 0.9 volts and digital is 
maybe 2.4 volts in future and uh, similarly uh, transmitters also so you need to have like tens of micro volts of power in your let us say variable or board area network devices and whatever and you need a very smart power management which it's, it doesn't actually consume power itself and gives power as much as possible to the load device and so in analog design in each of the verticals there is a concept of let us say architectural choices there are set of circuit architecture which are suited somewhere and they have got a different performance metric so this this slide just gives that overview let's say you have got an ldo so it has a variable resistor this transistor and then it's a step down functionality output voltage is lower than the input voltage and the conversion efficiency is this formula v out by v in basically so the limitation of the ldo is that this transistor is always consuming the total current so what if it is 1.8 this is 0.9 so entire current is going to flow through this device it does not need that current the current is needed by the load but this device needs to transfer so basically it is a continuous time solution but it doesn't work for let us say you have got a load of 10 ampere or 20 ampere it will not work if you you have a simple load of let us say 10 milliamp or 20 milliamp so ldos in the industry they tend to be not more than 200 milliamps actually so most of the times people try to make it within 10 to 20 or 30 40 milliamps kind of nd okay so that is a limitation then there are other like switch capacitor power converters where basically you take a two edges of a capacitor you trans you charge it to some reference voltage and then you connect to load device so whatever is the current consumed by the load device this capacitor is going to actually take it from somewhere and give it to here so advantage of here is that you i can actually put two three capacitors i can double up this voltage actually you can step up or step down this voltage the only thing is that the charge is going to come to this capacitor in discrete steps so it, it needs a clogged solution switched capacitor it is possible to implement this on the die with a switched capacitor at least this capacitor and the load capacitor is big enough in all the cases so it is tropically out on the outside the soc in most cases okay uh, so the third is the inductive the issue is that we have not been able to manufacture inductors which are actually production worthy for the uh, power consumption of the silicon chips so typically inductors are off chip components in any system and uh, the rest of the electronics is on the on chip so inductor and the big capacitors are out but you need a switching methodology here so you just give a peak current for a very short burst of time and when you give a peak current of very short burst of time and the, uh, and then you turn it off so the uh, this voltage charge is written by the capacitor and it is used so the advantage of inductor is that in a very short period of time it will give the peak current so you can actually reach efficiencies of 90 percent plus actually towards 100 percent so it has other things to take care very complex uh, work inside to manage this situation but for let us say atx kind of power supply where you are coming from your um, uh, uh, you you have got in your uh, smps power supply they are uh, by and large they are totally inductive power supplies in your desktops and all that from that you get 12 volt 5 volt 3.3 volt for the power wheel so they are switching power supplies okay switch modes power supplies and most of the time they are inductive power supplies and they give currents for mps of power consumption and here we we don't use ldos actually ld would actually heat up and it will uh, more than anything else actually so this is a basic diagram of a ldo showing it as a tunable resistor so you just tune the resistor so that you give the required voltage to the output load just a conceptual kind of diagram that's how circuit designers thinks so in terms of implementation it is like that there is a reference voltage and there is an amplifier with a virtual ground it actually these two actually pins are at same voltage so this output pin has to be v reference into one plus r2 by r1 so which is what is our target for the power voltage now to give the uh, to, to give load device the current so we have got a pmos transistor which is a part of this uh, this loop and this transistor is going to conduct the current the moment this takes more current so it will go down it will go down it will go up it will go down it will also go up Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I am not able to see any slide. I am showing some slide also. We can see the slide, ma'am. You need to just disconnect and reconnect the call. Okay. 
it's visible for us. Okay. So if, if we look at this solution, so it is like a. If you look at the solutions, so we have got a building blocks there. Voltage reference is there. Error amplifier is there. Feedback network is there. So, so, so circuit topology gives building blocks, and each one of them has to be designed and uh, fine tuned for the performance. Okay. So this is what I had from the circuit point of view. So now let me go about NXP. So NXP is actually it has employees in 30 plus countries and more around 30,000 employees. We had around 9,000 patents, and these are our revenue actually. They keep on changing year to year, but this is our okay. And it is a 60 plus year old company NXP. And in terms of application areas, so we we are leaders in automotive, industrial IoT, mobile and communication infrastructure, all, all of them. And automotive happens to be one of the focus areas of NXP. So if you look at this in a modern car, uh, NXP chips are there in almost every part of it. This is for your modern processor. It is for vision thing between two cars. How, how you connect V2X basically? And then ADAS is, ADAS is there, driver systems. So NXP is a player in this for a long time. LIDAR is also there. So we have like SOCs working with LIDAR and then with artificial intelligence. And system selling. So we also sell a lot of system with networking and power management within this car actually. Then we have got a lot of uh, uh, in last few years, you might have seen a lot of NXP SOC products having AI capability and all that. And uh, not many players have been able to scale, go up to lower technology nodes like 16 and 5 nanometer, which is available in this with the automotive solution. We are also into parking camera and all that radar. So almost all portions of the car which requires signal processing and all that, NXP is actually a leading player. So this is all my presentation guys. Any questions?